Do you want here? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What's up, everyone? My name is Uncle Jay. Thanks for checking out another vlog. It is a beautiful morning in Las Vegas. It's about 7.30, the sun is shining. It is gorgeous. We are going to go over how to crush small stakes online poker tournaments. I'm gonna to take you through, hand by hand, a $7 tournament that I played in which I took third place out of 504 players for about a 700 something dollar score. So, that's what this video is going to be all about. But first, I want to give you a few notes on discipline because that is one of the main qualities of successful poker players. The first thing you're going to want to do when trying to develop some sort of self-discipline is to set some sort of a goal. And I'm not talking about like a short-term goal. This is definitely a very long-term goal. Years minimum. Uh, but the goal is to do this for life. And we're talking, it could be monetary, it could be dietary, it could be fitness, it could be something about your job or craft. Whatever it is, set a goal and stick to it no matter what. My second tip that I'm going to give you for developing self-discipline is to fuel yourself, to fuel your body. And this also involves taking away poisons that are going into your body and I'm talking mostly about junk food here um, there are people that love potato chips mainly me if you love cakes if you love energy drinks or sodas whatever it may be realize that these are poor for our general health and I understand that discipline is much more of a mindset however when you're putting these certain items into your body it could make your energy just feel completely depleted and that takes away from our long-term goals, right? I suggest replacing your negative fuels with positive, mainly water. I know a lot of people think water is boring and bland. However, it's what our bodies are made of and it's Earth's, Earth's natural resource for a reason. We need it to live. So make sure you're drinking lots and lots of water and try to stay away from the junk food. Try to at least offset it with healthy snacks, with healthy meals, because it will just give us more energy and more motivation to achieve our goals. My final note on achieving self-discipline is to fail. And this is something that is required it is something that is going to happen in your journey of life. How do you respond to failure? And that's what separates the good from the great. Now, when you do fail at your fitness goal, let's say, let's say that you go out super late and you don't do your exercises the next day, you have a long day at work, you don't do your exercises again, it's your mother's birthday, you don't do whatever it may be, it's easy to go into a downward spiral and say, oh, I just messed up my whole fitness goal. Let me just self-sabotage myself. And I don't know why humans get that, but I do too. And it's just important to be aware of when you do fail, that you respond in a manner that is even stronger than ever. Realize that discipline is the slow game and you're not going to see results in just six or eight months. It's going to take years and years to develop this self-disciplined mindset. So make sure that you realize that it's, it's growth that is going to be seen in the long term. You're not going to see immediate results. And that's, you know, couldn't be a little bit discouraging for some. However, that's just reality and that's just the way life is. If it were that easy to have this type of self-discipline, then the entire world would be so different, right? But it's not and that's just not the way the world works. That's gonna be it for the discipline segment of this vlog. Let's get into some poker hands. I am splitting this tournament into three separate videos because I don't want to make an hour and a half long vlog on just this one tournament. So let's get to it. This first hand we're going to discuss, we pick up ace-king suited in the small blind position. We're facing an early position raise and a pot size three bet. That three bet gets 
cold called and I decide to call instead of four bet here. We are playing about 80 big blinds deep and I think that if we want to get all the money in by the river then that wouldn't be too difficult. So I decide to make the call and we go to the flop four ways. We see ace queen seven with one spade giving us a backdoor spade draw. I think we're checking here every time. I don't think there's any merit in leading out because if we bet and get raised, we're definitely gonna to have to call off or we're not gonna feel great about it. And we don't want to anyone to be folding out their queens or pocket jacks, any middle pairs like that. So it does check around, which is pretty unfortunate. And we turn in off a six, bringing in a backdoor flush draw. And I think we do need to be betting here. And like I said earlier, it's pretty easy to get our stacks in by the river. So we go ahead for a half pot bet into the 1700 pot and everyone calls. So the river is another six pairing the board. And I think we're just going to shove all in here. Uh, we bet 40% pot and we win a nice one. For this next hand, we pick up pocket sevens in the big blind. We're facing an early position raise and two players to my right call and I decide to close the action in the big blind. I think it's pretty standard. The flop comes ace five five. It checks to me and I think that we're going to check here. I don't think there's any merit in leading out because if we bet and get raised, I think that we're going to be folding 100% of the time. So it does check around to my surprise and the turn is an ace bringing in an, two aces, two fives. And I think that we need to be betting here uh, for value slash protection. Notice any card that's going to come in the river, not any card, but most cards that come in the river are particularly bad for pocket sevens, any over card, any spade. So I think that we can put out a small bet and try to clean up our equity here. Uh, we do make a $200 bet or 200 chip bet and we get called by the initial raiser and the river is the six of spades bringing in the flush and I don't think we need to be betting here because if you think about what's going to call us it's going to be hands that are only better than pocket sevens so we do check here and our villain bets three quarters pot and I think we have a simple fold. This next hand we're going to look at, we pick up pocket tens in early position. We make our standard 3x raise and we get two callers. The flop comes jack eight six rainbow and I decide to check and this, I think you can go either way, uh, check or bet, but given that we have two people behind us and jack eight six is a relatively easy board to connect with. There's a lot of straight draws. Uh, there's only one over pair, but I I didn't want to bet and get raised. I, I just kind of wanted to take my showdown value. If I can check call, check call on the turn in the river. If we don't get a bad run out, that was kind of my thought process, but I'm not really sure. I think you can either check or bet here, but we decide to ultimately check. And the person to our left makes it 500 into the 630 pot, which is obviously a, a pretty big bet. So we're not folding here uh, to just one bet. We're going to peel and see what develops on the turn. So we end up making the call. We're heads up on the turn, and the turn pairs the board, bringing in a backdoor flush draw as well. And we check to the aggressor, and he bets 1,500 into the 1,630 pot, which is an easy fold here. And I think that he's just betting way too much. And he ends up showing his ace jack. And if you're trying to get value from a jack, I think that you could be betting a smaller um, in hopes that pocket tens would call. So I think that you want to be going about 60% pot there, maybe 70% pot, but not 90%, uh, 90 plus percent. So we, we avoid one there. We save some chips and we'll take that every time. For this next hand, we pick up pocket eights in early position. We're facing a limper, and we decide to make a 4x raise, which is our typical raise. And we get three bet by this gambler person up top, who I now have labeled donkey. 
I've seen him spew off chips in a couple different spots already in this tournament. And we've been playing for less than an hour. So I know that he's capable of getting extremely out of line. Uh, however, his 3-bet is a very large 3-bet. And it's 840 chips for me to call. And I only have about 7,000 behind. So I'm getting the incorrect odds to draw to my set. You want to be getting 10 to 1. So I want to have about 8,500 chips behind to effectively set mine profitably. However, when the initial limper calls his 3-bet, I think that I am priced in because there are now two different players that I'm up against instead of just the one. So I think that this is just a set mine scenario, and if we don't hit our 8, we'll just get out of the way. And that's exactly what happens. Um, we miss on the flop, and it checks to the gambler. And his bet is such that it could sets up for an all-in shove on the turn and i don't think our pocket eights are that good e even though his range is probably wide i just think that we need to get out of the way here all right now the next hand we're looking at we see a6 suited in the cutoff position and there is only one big blind in this hand, folds around to us, and I decide to make a min raise. I usually three exit here, but since there's only one blind and I am in position, I think that a min raise is fine. So we make the raise and we get called by the big blind, and the flop comes ace nine six with two clubs, giving us two pair, and he checks to us. I think we definitely need to be betting here. And I think that half pot is fine as we flopped a really good hand. I don't see us folding to too much aggression in this scenario. So we make the bet and we get called. The turn is an ace, giving us the full house. And our opponent checks. And I think that we need to be checking behind here because if you think about what our opponent's going to call with, maybe a nine. If we bet small, um, but every other middle pair is going to fold, and all of his draws that are pretty mediocre are probably going to get out of the way. So I think we want to give him an opportunity to catch up because there's not any card on the river that I'm afraid of. However, if we make the mistake of betting here, and I think we lose out on some equity. All right, now we've got some really good action here. We look down and see pocket aces. We make our 3x raise and get called by the person to our left. And here comes Gambler throwing in his 3-bet from the button, a pot size 3-bet, which is a really big raise. And I don't think that we need to be 4-betting here because Gambler has already showed tendencies to spew off chips in unnecessary scenarios. So if he were to 4-bet, and if for some reason he happened to be bluffing or getting out of line in this hand, we want him to stay in with his entire range. So we decide to just make the call here, and the person to our left calls as well. And we see a flop of ace-5-3 giving us the effect of nuts, because I don't see anyone really showing up with 4-deuce here. I think we're checking this every time because, like I said earlier, we want our opponent to be betting as much as we can. And we don't want him to be playing well by facing him with aggression. So, to my surprise, it does check all the way around. And the turn is a 5, bringing in the full house for me and a backdoor flush draw. And I decided to check here again just in case any of my opponents were uh, afraid of the ace on the flop and they have maybe pocket kings, queens, or jacks, um, and perhaps by no aggression that they think that their hands are going to be good here. And I just want to be getting my opponents to bet and not scare them off in any pots. So the person to my left ends up shoving all in for about 85% pot, and Gambler calls pretty quickly. And I think that I do need to be shoving all in here for not that much more. Um, it's effectively a, a little bit more than a min raise. And I think that Gambler is going to have a really difficult time folding to a min raise after all of this chips winning on the turn. However, 
I just decided to make the call, which I'm pretty sure is a huge error. And the river is the nine of hearts bringing in the flush. And I shove all in for about 25% pot and gambler ultimately ultimately makes the fold and we end up taking down a nice pot however i do think we missed out on some decent equity here okay and here we have pocket aces yet again this is shortly after the add on break it was seven dollars to add on eight thousand chips and it is a $7 tournament to begin with 4,000 chips. So this add-on is pretty mandatory in this tournament. So uh, in this hand, we are facing an early position min raise, which uh, I would typically 3 exit or 2.5 exit. But if you prefer to min raise at this stage of the tournament, I'm pretty okay with it. I think it's fine. The villain two to my right, who I have labeled as a donkey, uh, ends up making the call for the min raise. And just to note, when I ever have someone labeled as a donk, it's because I've seen them spew off chips in scenarios that were absolutely unnecessary so that I know if I were ever going to get in the hand with them that they are more than capable of becoming totally maniacal and just giving away their chips. So when it comes to me in the small blind with pocket aces, we definitely have a three bet in order here. And this person to our right, uh, Nate, has about 33 or 34-ish big blinds. So we want to be mindful of that in, in the fact that if we want to get all the chips in by the river, then we're easily able to do so. So for that reason, I think that we just need to be raising to about a thousand here, and that should be able to set up an easy shove by the turn or the river. However, I've had experience in these smaller stakes tournaments that people just don't fold to three bet no matter how much you three bet. So I decided to size up to 1200, which is more than a pot size raise, and both villains decide to call. So that's always good. The flop comes queen, deuce, deuce, rainbow, and there's about 3,700 in the pot. And looking at Nate's stack, I think that betting about 1,300 will set up an easy shove on the turn, given our stack sizes. So we go ahead and make the bet, and the initial raiser makes the call. And then to my surprise, Nate clicks it back for the min raise. And this puts you, us in a tough scenario. I mean, we're never folding here, um, but what is he really clicking it back with? Either a queen or a deuce. And I think that our aces are just too good up against that range. So we make the call, and so does the initial villain. Uh, the turn ends up being an absolute brick, and I just think that we need to be betting here again because we don't want to give our opponents a free card, and I think that our aces are good here a large majority of the time. So we go ahead and shove and make it 400, and Nate shoves for not that much more, and he ends up flipping over King Deuce for flopped trips. And I think that this is just a particularly bad play by my opponent. When facing a min raise from under the gun, King Deuce suited, I think, is a very easy fold. However, if you want to splash around, uh, you know, you just be careful. However, when facing a three, a huge three bet, a more than a pot size three bet from out of position, I think that King Deuce is just going to be extremely dominated, uh, which obviously it was. But, you know, your opponent gets lucky every now and then. And don't get mad. Don't berate your opponents. Don't start calling them names. We need players like this to be playing poker because if plays like this were not made then it would not be a profitable game just drop the nice hand give him a thumbs up and let's move on speaking of moving on we pick up ace king offsuit in the very next hand and we're facing a limper from gambler of course because he likes to play a lot of hands and with ace king on the button we definitely want to be raising here i opt for the pot size raise to 540 chips 
I think my standard raise is usually about 480, but I know that Gambler is never folding anything ever, so I want to get the maximum equity that I can. So he does end up making the call, and we go to a flop to see King Jack Deuce with two clubs, and Gambler leads into us for 1260, which is an exactly uh, pot-sized bet. And I think we have two options here, either to call or to raise. And I think that calling is the far better option because if we do raise, then if Gambler is bluffing in this spot, then he can easily get off the hook. But by just calling, we keep him in with his entire range and we give him more opportunities to bluff on later streets. So for that reason, we do make the call and the turn ends up being a four of clubs completing the flush, not the card that we wanted to see. And this is a surprising move, even though he is a gambler, he shoves all in for almost four times the pot, like a 3.8 times the pot, which is just outrageous and humongous. Uh, however, knowing what Gambler is capable of, I am just not going to fold here. And to be honest, I actually just snap called this without even thinking about it. And Gambler rolls over 5-3 offsuit uh, with the three of clubs. So he had an open-ended straight draw and a really bad club draw. And this is just a really poor play by my opponent because he could easily be drawing dead into betting into a flush that's just better than his so you know in these games it's important to be paying attention to your opponents because if i'm like watching tv or if i'm you know playing a game on the side or talking to friends on the side or talking on the phone then we may not have seen gambler get out of line in other hands and this could be a spot that we could be making a snug fold in a lot of scenarios but given that we have a lot of information on this player we make the call and scoop up a really nice pot this is just something I wanted to go over real quick. There's still 411 players left in the tournament, still really early. However, just take a look at the pay structure. You'll see that 100th place all the way up to about 40th place. There's only an $8 difference between $18 and $26, and I am in for $14. And there are unlimited rebuys during registration, but you want to make sure that you're not in for four or five and six bullets because when you do cash and you do run a little deep then most of the time you're breaking even at best so for that reason i don't usually buy in for more than three bullets in these tournaments because they pay out so many players um, so just be mindful of that when you're playing your tournament here we have pocket nines there is one big blind no small blind in this hand we make our min raise from early position and we get called by the villain on the button and the person in the big blind as well. The flop comes king four deuce rainbow checks to us and I decided to check back which is an error. We definitely need to be betting here for value slash protection. Um, if any 10 jack queen or ace comes those are particularly bad for our hand. So we definitely want to be putting out a bet. So I don't know why I checked, but this is definitely an error. Checks through. Turn is in offsuit king, pairing the board, and the big blind villain leads out for 800 into the 1400 pot. Our only option here is to call. There's no reason to be raising because we're only going to get called by better hands. The river is a deuce, pairing the board yet again, and villain bets another 800. Another very easy call here. And he rolls over 7-3 offsuit, which I have no idea why he's even in this hand or even putting chips into the pot. This just goes to show that poker is not dead, ladies and gentlemen. There are plenty of donkeys here willing to give us their money. Ace-King from under the gun. We make a min-raise. And it goes all the way around to Nate, who we have labeled Donkey, and he 3-bets us to 1500 which is a relatively small 3-bet, given that if you were to do a full pot size 3-bet, it would be 2500 or so. 
So by him making it 1500 it's a pretty weak 3-bet, especially from out of position. And the big blind cold calls a 3-bet. I think that we do need to be 4-betting here, um, given that I think that this Nate person is relatively weak. And our big blind here calling the 3-bet, he should have a relatively strong range. But we are in position and having ace-king as two big blockers, I think it's a good hand to 4-bet. However, I chicken out and I just decide to call, but I think that this is an error and that we do need to be 4-betting here. The flop comes 8-7-5 with two hearts, and this is a really bad board for our hand because we have zero hearts, and all these middle cards are relatively easy for our opponents to be connecting with. So it checks around to me, and I decide to check back, and I'm just not going to give too much action here unless we turn or river something really good. And we end up turning the king, uh, the king of hearts, uh, but it does complete the very obvious flush. And Nate, the initial three better checks, and the big blind bets 75% pot. And I think that our ace king is just too good to fold here to one bet, given that we have top pair, top kicker. Even though we don't have any hearts, I think folding is just too tight and that we could be easily taken advantage of and if we fold here. So we do make the call and Nate makes the fold. The river is an offsuit nine, uh, bringing in an obvious straight. It looks like any six beats us here. Uh, there are a lot of straight possibilities out there in general. And our opponent bets three quarters pot again. And I think that we have a fold here. If you think about what we're beating, uh, what king queen, king jack, Pocket queens, pocket jacks, pocket tens. Uh, is our opponent really betting that much with those hands? I think the answer is probably not. Because if he were betting that much with, like, let's say, pocket tens, then he's not doing it for value. It's definitely as a bluff. And it looks like our opponent is betting for value here. And I think that our ace king is pretty dead. So we go ahead and make the snug full. We never found out what our opponent has. However, I think this is a good fold. For the final hand of the vlog, we pick up King Jack of Spades on the button, folds all the way around to us, and we make a min raise, and we get called by the villain in the big blind. The flop comes 9-5 deuce with two clubs, and our opponent checks, and I think that we should be continuation betting here because... 9-5 deuce is a really difficult board for anyone to connect with. So I think that betting between 40 and 50% pot is perfectly fine, and that's exactly what we do. And our opponent decides to make the call. The turn is the jack of clubs, giving us top pair and bringing in the flush. Our opponent decides to check again, and given that we have top pair, it gives us a uh, good showdown value so I don't think that we need to be betting here because our opponent is probably not going to be calling us with any nine or maybe a worse jack um, and he, we don't want to get check raised here as that'll put us in a really nasty spot as well so I think checking behind is the best option and that's what we do the river is an offsuit four and our opponent thinks for about 15 seconds and he ends up making a half pot bet. I think that we only have one option here, and that is to call. I don't think we're ever folding here. If he has a flush, he has a flush, or if he has two pair, it is what it is, but our hand is just too good to be folding to one bet, and he shows up with queen deuce. And I don't love my opponent's bet here on the river. If you want to take a bluff at it, which is what he was doing, I think he needs to bet a lot more. Um, if I were faced with uh, like a 75 or 80% um, bet, then I would probably still call. So that means that if my opponent wants to bluff, he should probably be over betting to about one and a half times the pot or two times pot. So that's going to be it for today's vlog. Um, if you like what you saw, please click the thumbs up button. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you soon.